Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. In the previous videos, we really focused on the process of filtration that occurs between the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. We're now ready to study reabsorption. Remember what the definition is of reabsorption. It refers to the movement of solutes and water in the filtrate into the epithelial cells of the tubule and from there the solutes and water could also go into the blood. So if we sketch this real quick, if this is our tubule, let's say this is our proximal convoluted tubule right here, this is where our filtrate is, and then right here is the blood, B for blood, with in between right here we have the interstitial fluid. Then what we mean by reabsorption is that water and solutes in the filtrate will somehow manage to make it into these epithelial cells of the tubule and then they will typically diffuse through the interstitial fluid into the blood, the capillary right there. So that's what we refer to as reabsorption, particularly in the kidneys. In the kidneys, this, the water and the solutes, especially the solutes that are present in the filtrate, almost all get returned to the proximal convoluted tubule. And this occurs again, as I mentioned earlier, by the solutes and also the water passing through the epithelial cells to eventually reach the blood. The processes by which this occurs might be either active or passive. Not only that, sometimes we'll see that solutes and solvents will use the so-called transcellular pathway, which is what I've actually been explaining, where our solute and our water pass through the actual epithelial cell. But at times we'll see that water, but also some of our electrolytes can sneak in between our cuboidal cells that make up our uh, proximal convoluted tubule. And there we find tight junctions, but these particles are small enough to where they can sneak through these tight junctions in between the cells. So we talk about the transcellular pathway, where we transcend through the, the cells and the paracellular pathway where we go essentially outside of the cells, uh, the epithelial cells that is. We're going to focus on uh, both of these pathways in the next picture and then all of this terminology that I have here which is actually uh, essentially a flow chart of the flow of the solutes and the solvent uh, from the filtrate into the blood. So you may want to come back to this pathway to uh, really get this down after we've looked at the pictures. So this is kind of a busy picture, so let's first get oriented. In the black we see our simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. These are the nuclei of our cuboidal cells that form the wall of our proximal convoluted tubule and of course these are the microvilli that increase the surface to therefore uh, make absorp absorption as efficient as possible or reabsorption I should say. Inside of the lumen here this is where our filtrate is located with our water and solutes that are going to be reabsorbed either through our cells, and that's of course our transcellular pathway, or in between the cells, through these tight junctions right here, and that we call the paracellular route. Notice that our destination is right here, the blood and the capillary. If, however, water and solutes stop here inside of our epithelial cells, we would still call that reabsorption. But really the goal of reabsorption is typically for substances to make it all the way into the blood. Notice that we have a little bit of space here in between our capillary and our cuboidal cells and that is of course filled with interstitial fluid. 
the surface of our ciliate, I'm not ciliate, I'm sorry, cells with microvilli, um, we'll refer to as the luminal membrane, but if you prefer to call that the apical surface, that's fine. While this we tend to refer to as the basal lateral membrane, which is where we would expect the basement membrane surface to be, or the surface of the cell that, that touches the basement membrane. I use two different colors to illustrate whether the movement or the transport mechanism of our substance is passive or active. Water, of course, always moves by osmosis, so that's by default passive. But solutes might move passively, or they might move by means of active transport. And the solutes, depending again on their size, might have to depend on the transcellular or paracellular route. Reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule is extremely efficient. Take a look at this. Almost all of the organic nutrients, and remember what that means, that means all the carbohydrates, all the, the, the amino acids, all of the component of the, the parts that made up nucleic, nucleic acids, all the, the, the small lipids are going to be reabsorbed in, into um, the blood that surrounds the proximal convoluted tubules. And many of them are going to depend on secondary active transport, which is something that you were introduced to in the digestive system, in the digestive tract, and I'll quickly review it for you here uh, in this video. Water will always move by osmosis. Of course, that is a, that's a form of passive transport. And remember, lipids can very easily pass through the phospholipid bilayer of the cell membrane, so they can also move by diffusion, assuming there's a good enough gradient. And the small little proteins that might have snuck through the filtration membrane, they can be reabsorbed by means of endocytosis uh, and then transported across the, the cuboidal cell by what we call transcytosis, meaning they're carried in a little vesicle. So by the time the filtrate leaves the proximal convoluted tubule to enter into the loop of Henle, take a look. It has been reduced by 70 to 80 percent, so we're only left with about 30 or, or 20 or 30 percent of the filtrate by the time we get to the loop of Henle. That's pretty impressive. Remember from the digestive system that we really can't have a secondary active transport mechanism unless we have also a primary active transport mechanism. And this is all, all of course, relating to sodium. Sodium is our most numerous or most abundant positive ion in the filtrate. And we're going to see that because sodium can be pumped out of our tubule cell into the interstitial fluid and then uh, diffuse from the interstitial fluid into the blood because it gets pumped and then diffuses into the blood, we create an electrochemical gradient to where now we'll see that sodium can actually diffuse from the filtrate into our tubule cell. That seemed like a lot of information. Let's take a closer look at this with a sketch. First, let's refresh our memory on the cell concentration gradients. Remember, if we're looking at any cell in the body, it doesn't matter which one, the concentration gradient for potassium is always such that the inside is much more, um, or that we have a much higher concentration for potassium on the inside of the cell compared to the outside. So potassium likes to leak out of cells. Sodium, on the other hand, has the opposite gradient. The concentration of sodium outside of cells is always higher than on the inside, so sodium likes to leak in. Purple refers to passive transport. And then these are two other ions, calcium and chloride, for which you should also be uh, with, you should also know their concentration gradients. And um, you should have studied all this in, in uh, previous chapters and, also, and certainly in Anatomy and Physiology 1. So let's now apply that knowledge to our picture at the top. So here we're looking once again at our cuboidal cell with its microvilli. 
Here's our filtrate in the yellow. Here's our interstitial fluid in the gray. Here's our blood in the red. At the basal lateral membrane of our cuboidal cell, we have sodium potassium pumps. They depend on the hydrolysis of ATP to pump sodium against its concentration gradient out. Remember, sodium likes to leak in passively, so it takes energy to pump it out. Similar principle for the movement of potassium against its concentration gradient, it would have to move in. Now, there are many, many, many leakage channels for potassium. So potassium, as soon as it's pumped into the cell, almost immediately leaks out. So we're losing all of these positively charged ions at this side of our cell. And that sets up an electrochemical gradient that sodium can take advantage of. In other words, we're going to see that the inside of our cell remains negative enough compared to the outside, and that's going to help with literally drawing in our sodium into our cell. It's going to follow this electrical gradient, and it's going to follow its concentration gradient, because remember, sodium ions are always higher on the outside of cells compared to the inside, even in the filtrate. Now, we refer to our transport of sodium with the help of the sodium-potassium pump as our primary active transport. While here, where sodium is moving passively, so there is absolutely no ATP involved here, no ATP, no expenditure of energy, cellular energy, this here we refer to as secondary active transport of sodium. I have illustrated here glucose of an example of a substance that takes advantage of that secondary active transport of sodium. So the same protein that allows for sodium to diffuse into the cell at the luminal, luminal membrane of our cell is also going to allow for glucose to bind and tag along. So this is how many of the solutes in the filtrate manage to make it into our cell and then into the blood, sometimes against their concentration gradient. But this secondary active transport really allows this to happen. Again, to review this, remember it is the primary active transport of sodium, meaning with the help of the sodium-potassium pump, so this requires our pump, this, which requires ATP, that sets up that electrochemical gradient. And it's that electrochemical gradient that provi provides the, the energy to allow for sodium to just move passively on the other side of the membrane of the cell. And that we call secondary active transport, which is going to be a passive transport. So this does not, not require any ATP. So I've given you here a quick little picture to remind you that different transporter proteins might be functioning as a uniporter or uh, a synporter, meaning that both substances move in the same direction or they move in opposite directions. The sodium-potassium pump is obviously an antiport. And if we take a look at how sodium diffuses in and glucose tags along, where that occurs with the help of the protein, that protein is a synporter. So right here, uh, again, a quick little sketch, really, it's not representing, the labels are not really accurately representing our kidney scenario, except that, yes, here we are looking at the cytoplasm of our cuboidal cell. All right. But rather than this being the extracellular fluid, we're going to replace this with filtrate. And so this is 
is, this is going to represent the luminal surface of our cell. In other words, this is not where we have our ATP pumps. This is the side where we are seeing secondary active transport. So we're going to see that a protein is going to have the ability to bind both sodium, which are these little hexagons here in our picture, as well as glucose to then allow for the glucose to be transported together with the sodium from the filtrate into the cuboidal cell. Notice that the concentration of sodium ions is higher on the outside of the cell in the filtrate compared to the inside of the cell, which is normal. And of course that concentration gradient helps with the easy passive diffusion of sodium from the outside to the inside of the cell as the arrows show. But we also need that electrical gradient that is maintained by pumping sodium out on the other, at the other end of our cell. So with the help of that pump at the basal lateral membrane and getting rid of sodium, not only are we setting up an electrical gradient, but we're also going to maintain our concentration gradient. In other words, we continue to get rid of the sodium that we bring here, bring in here, by pumping it out on the other side. And so this whole mechanism can continue going. Now, in addition to secondary active transport that helps things such as glucose and amino acids in particular be reabsorbed, we find that the primary active transport of sodium is also going to help with the movement and the reabsorption of our water and many of the other substances. So let's take a look at that. So if sodium is constantly being taken out of the filtrate, moved across our cuboidal cell and into the blood, we're going to see that water is going to follow the sodium. You know, that's very typical in our body. If sodium moves in one direction, water tends to eventually follow. But we're also going to see that as all of this water is following sodium, eventually other solutes will try to follow that water, right? Because we're now setting up a concentration gradient. If we're moving all of this water, we're going to get see a solute concentration gradient that is going to allow them to move. Now, these solutes are going to have to be able to pass easily through the cell membrane and so they're going to have to be mostly fat soluble substances or even cations, in other words, um, positive ions. And this explains this so-called solvent drag. This explains why sometimes we have various solutes being dragged along by water that really should have stayed in the filtrate. Things such as toxins and drugs that therefore can get very difficult to excrete. So we talk about solvent drag and also not just water reabsorption, but we're going to specify it as obligatory water reabsorption. Later on, we're going to see that there's something called facultative water reabsorption. Facultative implying that there is an option for the water reabsorption. Water doesn't have an option here to be reabsorbed or not. It is a, by default, it just has to follow the sodium. It doesn't have any other way of going about it. Now, how do most of these substances that were moved into our epithelial cell, how do they make it into our uh, blood? Well, we find that most of them are going to leave the cell on the uh, other side at the basal lateral membrane, or here I'm just calling it the basal membrane, by means of facilitated diffusion, so passive transport again. And here we see a nice 
overview of the many different substances that are going to move by secondary uh, transport, such as um, various ions that can also tag along with sodium, for instance chloride here and calcium can tag along with sodium, but notice that we see plenty of antiports, notice that often as sodium is reabsorbed we're going to secrete hydrogen ions and so that should already give you a little bit of an inkling about the fact that this, the secondary active transport mechanisms can actually also influence the pH of our blood and the filtrate. Amino acids like to tag along with sodium glucose as well and then also we see here phosphate ions. And then water on the other hand will use passive transport meaning osmosis uh, in response to the movement of all of this sodium out of our cell into the bloodstream. So the water is just being dragged along. Remember we call that um, obligatory water reabsorption. We do not have included in this image the substances that follow the water by means of solvent drag because they are typically going to be lipid soluble. Okay, so now that we have a better understanding of what we mean by reabsorption and the mechanisms involved, let's talk about transport maximum, abbreviated TM. It's expressed in milligrams per minute because it represents how many transport carriers there are present in the renal tubules, particularly the proximal convoluted tubules. That is where, of course, most reabsorption occurs. So the more carriers there are for, let's say, glucose in the renal tubule, then the transport maximum for glucose will be high, uh, or higher than, for instance, uh, an amino acid for which there are less carriers. All right. So pretty much every substance that is actively reabsorbed, so that does not include lipid-soluble substances, uh, pretty much everything else is going to have a transport maximum, except for sodium. So not sodium and not the lipids that can easily diffuse across the cell membrane. So when each one of these carrier proteins is totally occupied and busy, but there is more of it's of the, the substance with which these carriers are specialized to bind, those substances cannot be reabsorbed, right? So for instance, let's say that all the carriers for glucose are occupied and busy, but there is still more glucose present in the filtrate. That glucose in the filtrate that cannot bind to any of its carriers is going to stay in the filtrate and consequently we end up with glucose in our urine. And we can refer to that as hyperglycemia, meaning too much sugar in the blood, right? And of course that is the typical symptom of a person who suffers from the other type of diabetes that we haven't said much about diabetes mellitus. We have in the past brought up diabetes insipidus, which is due to a problem with ADH. Now there are also a whole bunch of things that cannot be reabsorbed or just do not get reabsorbed. Again, if there's not enough carriers, we just discussed that, if they're not lipid soluble and they don't have a carrier, or they're just too large and they're kind of stuck in the filtrate. There are also things that are partially reabsorbed. Urea, despite the fact that it's a nitrogenous waste, some of it actually gets reabsorbed and um, there's a reason for why we do that and we'll learn about that later on. Uric acid, but especially creatinine, I've brought this up before, does not get reabsorbed at all. And that is why we can look at a lab report for somebody's creatinine clearance. Since none of this gets reabsorbed, all of it must be excreted 
in the filtrate or in the urine. And so we can get an idea by measuring creatinine levels to, um, of, of our functioning of our glomerulus. Now again, a lot of reabsorption occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule. Uh, we mentioned before that almost all organic solutes are reabsorbed there. But there's still more reabsorption of water and electrolytes more distally, meaning in the loop of Henle, in the uh, distal convoluted tubules, in the collecting ducts. So be aware of that, that we haven't quite reabsorbed everything. Once we are further away, particularly in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct, we're going to see that often the reabsorption of substances, particularly the reabsorption of water and certain ions, is going to be very dependent on hormones. And you're familiar with these hormones already. Antidiuretic hormone, aldosterone, and parathyroid hormone that's going to regulate calcium levels. So in the loop of Henle, we're going to be reabsorbing water and salt especially. And as we get further into the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct, again, various um, electrolytes, mostly with the help of um, hormones, as mentioned before, water again. And notice that here we're going to start talking about bicarbonate ions as well. In the collecting duct, we're going to reabsorb water with the help of ADH and also urea. And we'll see how important a role urea plays when we learn about the concentrating of urine. So reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule especially occurs by secondary, well, ac primary active transport, secondary active transport, osmosis of water, meaning obligatory water reabsorption, uh, solvent drag, particularly of lipid soluble substances. But when we get to our distal convoluted tubules and collecting ducts, we find that these substances cannot so easily get across the cell membrane. And instead, we depend on hormones, the binding of hormones to the tubular cells in these areas of the uh, nephron. So ADH, when it binds to our distal convoluted tubule, it'll trigger the cells to build aquaporins. Remember, those are little water channels. And now water will be able to move along its concentration gradient. But notice this is, requires the help of a hormone in order for water to be able to move passively. And so therefore, we refer to this as facultative reabsorption. And we'll ad address this again later on but I might as well already introduce you to the terminology here. Facultative referring to the fact that we need um, the help of a hormone, in this case ADH. We also see that aldosterone can, when it binds to the tubular cells, is going to trigger the cell to build more proteins that function as sodium potassium pumps. And of course, that is going to increase reabsorption of sodium. And if ADH is around, then water can follow in that area. Finally, parathyroid hormone, remember, regulates calcium levels. It, uh, parathyroid hormone can actually uh, prevent the osteoblasts from building too much bone tissue and stimulate the osteoclast so that calcium is released into the blood. But when PTH binds to the renal tubules, it can trigger those cells to reabsorb more calcium as well. And as PTH is stimulating the kidneys to reabsorb more calcium, this in turn stimulates the kidneys to make more vitamin D. Which makes sense, right? Because if we're low on vitamin, I'm sorry, if we're low on calcium in the blood, we need to find ways to bring up our calcium levels. And so we can do that also by absorbing calcium from our diet. But in order to do that, 
our small intestine depends on vitamin D. Without vitamin D in our small intestine, we cannot absorb calcium from our food that we eat. And then finally, calcium and phosphate always move in opposite directions in the body. When calcium is reabsorbed, it's going to block the reabsorption of phosphate. And I'm sorry, this is a typo. This should say PO4, 3 minus, right? So PO4, 3 minus. I'm sure you know that by now. Um, and the reason for this is because obviously if we were to reabsorb both calcium and phosphate, you know very well that they like to react and form little crystals. Not only would that be a problem to form crystals like this, but not, in addition to that, it would make the calcium unavailable in the blood plasma for all the different processes that depend on calcium, whether it's blood clotting or muscle contraction or nerve signaling, etc., etc. This video L wraps up our discussion on reabsorption. In the next video, we will focus on secretion and how important a role it plays in regulation of pH of the blood.